and tonight we need to put another one of those uh, components in place and the particular study that we're going to look at tonight usually takes about 10 hours so we're we're just going to do it here this evening and I'm telling you out front this is an abbreviated version but we want to take there's several several truths in this study that are worth developing we just want to make sure that we're familiar with two of them but before we get to the end of the week so we're going to lay out the basic structure of every reform movement and then emphasize two or three of those the way marks that are in each reform movement so we'll begin um, under the title the banner of the third angel and what I'm suggesting about the banner of the third angel what it is it uh, represents the prophetic way marks that are present in every reform movement I'll try to explain that as we go on prophecy has been fulfilling line upon line the more firmly we stand under the banner of the third angels message the more clearly we shall understand the prophecy of Daniel for the revelation is the supplement of Daniel the more fully we accept the light presented by the Holy Spirit through the consecrated servants of God the deeper and surer even as the eternal throne will appear the truths of ancient prophecy we shall be assured that men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost men must themselves be under the influence of the Holy Spirit in order to understand the Spirit's utterances through the prophets these messages were given not for those that uttered the prophecies but for us who are living amid the scenes of their fulfillment now, what I'm suggesting here is that there's a way that the three angels messages are a banner and they're a banner in, the, in a sense that you can use them in a way that allows you to understand Bible prophecy okay um, and the key to recognizing this banner I believe is the first thing that she says line upon line how you bring one prophetic line upon another prophetic line upon another prophetic line in order to build the complete story and that's what we're going to be tried, trying to do here this evening that was selected messages book 2 page 114 and from councils to writers to writers and editors page 26 27 and it, it, there are men in Adventism that are pretty militant against what we teach and one of the things where I think they misunderstand what we teach is when it comes to the three angels messages they appear to understand the three angels messages strictly in the term of the terms of theology you know what's the theological message of the first angels message what's the theological message of the second angel what's the theological message of the third angel and they do have theological messages that are important to understand but as we read these quotes notice that sister white is emphasizing the location where these messages arrived in history this is a different approach a different understanding of these messages the proclamation of the first second and third angels message has been located by the word of inspiration not a peg or pin is to be removed no human authority has any more right to change the location of these messages than to substitute the New Testament for the old she's not talking about the theology of the messages she's talking about where they arrived in history and the sequence that they arrived in history she does that often uh, next quote from selected messages book 2 page 104 the first and second angels message were, were given in 1843 and 1844 and we are now under the proclamation of the third but all th of the all three of the messages are still to be proclaimed it is just as essential now as ever before that they shall be repeated to those who are seeking for truth by pen and voice we are to sound the proclamation doing what showing their order and the application of the prophecies that bring us to the third angels message there cannot be a third without a first and second and this is an important thought there can't be a third without a first and second they have to be together okay if there were if there wasn't a first and second then the third would have to be the first right it's just simple math if there was only a second then the third would be the second and the second would be the first right they're a unit they're a unit there cannot be a third without a first and second these messages we are to give to the world in publications and discourses showing in the line of prophetic history 
the things that have been and the things that will be. Where these messages came into history provides us with a tool to not only go back and identify correctly the sequence of events that took place in the Millerite history, because that's when these messages came into history, but in so doing, we will be developing a history that allows us to illustrate the end of the world. The things that have been and the things that will be. Publishing Ministry, page 175, says, Again and again I've been shown that the past experiences of God's people are not to be counted as dead facts. We are not to treat the record of these experiences as we would treat a last year's almanac. The record is to be kept in mind, for history will repeat itself. Review and Herald, July 31st, 1888. We must have a knowledge of the scriptures that we may trace down the lines of prophecy. Sister White identifies prophecy. She expresses it as lines, and they are. And, you, and it's important to conceptualize that. Prophecy is illustrated on a line. That we may trace down the lines of prophecy and understand the specifications given by the prophets and by Christ and the apostles that we may not be ignorant but be able to see the day of, is approaching so that with increased zeal and effort we may exhort one another to faithfulness, piety, and holiness. She has statements on that last thought in that paragraph that many in Adventism aren't aware of. She says that we are required to know when it is near. It will be just as fatal for us not to know that the end is near as it was for the antediluvians not to know that the flood was coming. She says that in the great controversy. Yet in Adventism today, many times we say, well, with prophecy, we really don't know what it is until after it's fulfilled. And um, we're required to understand in advance what's going to take place. Now, the point of reference for end-time Bible prophecy is the book of Revelation. If you're going to bring one line of prophecy together with another line, together with another line, <clears throat> the clearest illustration of end time events is found in the book of Revelation. And this is what she's, one of the things she's teaching here in Acts of the Apostles, page 585. In the Revelation, all the books of the Bible meet an end. But the book of Revelation is the same book as the book of Daniel. She says that in a variety of ways. I like this next quote. Uh, on, in that regard, Manuscript Releases, Volume 9, page 7 and 8 says, Revelation is a sealed book, but it's also an open book. It records, records marvelous events that are to take place in the last days of this earth's history. Have people opposed what we teach? Because they, they're saying that when we teach Revelation, what we should be doing is uplifting Christ. And in so saying, they're saying that we are not going to understand, nor should we be identifying events here at the end of the world, that that's a denial of the, what we're supposed to do with Revelation. We're supposed to be uplifting Christ. But Sister White is clear that the book of Revelation records the events that take place at the end of the world. It doesn't mean that you're not supposed to say anything about Christ. But you should be saying something about both sides of the issue, not avoiding your responsibility as a student of prophecy to understand what end time events are. It records marvelous events that are to take place in the last days of this earth's history. The teachings of this book are definite, not mystical and unintelligible. In it, in the book of Revelation, the same line of prophecy is taken up as in Daniel. Some prophecies God has repeated, thus showing the importance, that importance must be given to them. The Lord does not repeat things that are of no great consequence. You find something in the, the Word of God one time, it's important. But if you say, see that same theme repeated over and over and over again, then it's of supreme importance. Now, in Isaiah 28, and there, there's many things this week that we'll be dealing with from Isaiah 28. And I'll tell you, one of the, the reason that I gave you the handout, along with your notes tonight, that particular handout that starts with Dear Friends is an article on the latter rain and some of the some of the truths connected with the latter rain that aren't commonly understood or actually opposed in Adventism and one of the things that the latter rain is is it is a message okay and in Isaiah 28 here what I'm going to what I'm going to suggest what we're going to try to demonstrate is that the way that the latter rain message is taught at the end of the world is being identified here in Isaiah 28 
verses 9 through 13, and the latter rain message is taught by the teachers that teach it at the end of the world by, by bringing line upon line, here a little, there a little. So we'll read through Isaiah 28, verses 9 through 13, but I forewarn you, this week we're going to come back to this passage a few times. But this time we're just going to make a couple points and keep moving through. If you're not familiar with the fact that the principle that all the prophets are speaking about the end of the world, the handout that we gave you last night on prophetic keys, that's one of the principles that we identify in that booklet. All the prophets are speaking about the end of the world more than the days in which they lived. You'll see a quote in that handout where Sister White says that. She says, each of the ancient prophets spoke more for our day than the days in which they lived so that their prophesying is in force for those of us that live at the end of the world. And then she immediately quotes 1 Corinthians 10:11. Now all these things happen as in samples. So when we are reading here Isaiah 28, we need to understand that Isaiah is speaking about right now. Because this is the end of the world. I hope we all are aware of it. This is when Isaiah was speaking about, and he says, Whom shall he, whom shall he teach knowledge? Whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. <clears throat> In 1 Corinthians 14.32, Paul says, The spirits of the prophets are subject unto the prophets. One of the things that means is that the, all the prophets agree with one another. So when Isaiah here is talking about line upon line, and Sister White, we just read several quotes where Sister White's talking about the lines of prophecy. They're in agreement with one another because they're both prophets, and the spirits of the prophets are subject unto the prophets. In verse 33, the next verse in 1 Corinthians 14 says, For God is not the author of confusion. If Sister White is referring to a line and Isaiah is referring to a line, they're referring to the same thing. If they weren't, the Bible and the spirit of prophecy would be very confusing. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. To what people? His people, the Seventh-day Adventist Church at the end of the world. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people to whom he said, this is the rest. And we touched on it last night. The rest is the refreshing, it's the latter rain, and it's the Seventh-day Adventist Church. That he's told, that God's told in his word and in the spirit of prophecy, the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, that we are the church that will receive the latter rain. That's the promise given to us. We're the, the, the people that he's going to raise up the 144,000. And Isaiah's agreeing with that. He says, for with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people to whom he said. He says to the Seventh-day Adventist church, I'm going to purify you and pour my Holy Spirit out upon you. This is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing. Yet when it comes to the time period at the end of the world where he's going to give them the latter rain, the rest and the refreshing, there's going to be a group in Adventism that says, yet they would not hear. Sister White clearly says in Great Controversy 611, the refreshing is the latter rain. And here you can see in this verse that the refreshing is something that has to be heard. It's a message. Okay? And then in the next verse it says, But the word of the Lord. What's the word of the Lord? It's a message. <laughs> but the word of the Lord was unto them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. Notice that God's people that receive the mark of the beast, because this is at the end of the world, and God's people at the end of the world are either going to receive the seal of God or the mark of the beast, and those that are snared and fall backwards and are broken, they're the ones that receive the mark of the beast. Why do they receive the mark of the beast? Because they would not receive the word of the Lord, they would not receive the message that comes to God's people during the time period of the refreshing, during the time period of the latter rain. And that message will be taught by bringing line upon line. From this part of the Bible, that part of the Bible, here a little, there a little. Jeremiah 6.16 says, Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein. You shall find rest for your souls. You'll find the latter rain. But they said, we will not walk therein. Here's this controversy we were dealing with last night. In Isaiah 58.12 it says, And they that sh shall... And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations. And thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach. The restorers of the past to dwell in. Now if, if someone has the willingness. Remember. If I don't come back to this verse. Tonight. 
before we break up tonight, say, Brother Jeff, go back. There was something else that you wanted to say about Isaiah 58, 12. I don't want to say it right now, but there's a really a nice point that we, I want to make at the end, but I'm prone to forget things. And, he, and here's a great controversy where Sister White identifies that the refreshing is the latter rain. Great Controversy 611, the great work of the gospel is not to close with less manifestation of the power of God than marked its openings. The prophecies, and this is an important point here, the prophecies which were fulfilled in the outpouring of the former rain at the opening of the gospel are again to be fulfilled at the latter rain at its close. Now brothers and sisters, we're identifying from prophecy that the latter rain is already sprinkling on God's people. Now some people don't realize that the latter rain first begins to sprinkle while the wheat and tares of Adventism are still together. It can be demonstrated from the Bible and spirit of prophecy that this is so. It begins to sprinkle before the Sunday law. That's why in, t in Testimonies to Ministers, Sister White says, the latter rain will be falling on hearts all around them, but they will not receive or recognize it. There's a time in Adventism when the wheat and tares are still together, and some of in Adventism are receiving the latter rain, and the other ones aren't receiving it. But at the Sunday law, the wheat and tares are separated. The tares receive the mark of the beast, the wheat receives the seal of God, and then the Holy Spirit is poured out without measure. And that's just as it was in Pentecost, you can show that the sprinkling began before Pentecost, and then at Pentecost it was poured out without measure. But what I want you to say, understand here, is there's people we're identifying now from prophecy that the latter rain is sprinkling in, on Adventists. And there's people in Adventism that are saying, there's no way, you don't, there's no way prophetically in the Bible or spirit prophecy that you can actually say specifically that the latter rain is falling. But here Sister White says, that the prophecies that were fulfilled at Pentecost in the former reign, they're going to be repeated. Is that not what she said? The prophecies which were fulfilled in the outpouring of the former reign at the opening of the gospel are again to be fulfilled in the latter reign at its close. And in Acts chapter 3, when the latter reign was falling in the former reign, there was Peter. And what was Peter doing? He's saying, this is the prophecy of Joel. The Holy Spirit is being poured out and Sister White says the same prophecies that were fulfilled then are going to be repeated. In other words, when the latter rain is poured out, you should expect to see people in God's church saying, the latter rain is falling. She just said it. The same prophecies that were fulfilled then are fulfilled at the end. Was that a fulfillment of prophecy when Peter was identifying that truth? Absolutely. Here are the times of refreshing to which the Apostle Peter looked forward to when he said, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus. So, <clears throat> here's the passage in Acts. Um, Acts 2, 14 through 21. That I just referred to. We don't have to read it. You said Some of you said amen, so you understood... That passage, that's my point. But the part from uh, chapter 3, which is the same story, Acts chapter 3, verses 17 through 24, I'm going to read through that very quickly because I want you to see something there, if you would. As, as Peter's explaining what's going on there, he says, hey, you understand what I'm reading? I'm skipping over Acts 2, 14 through 21. I'm on the top of page 3 of the notes. In Acts 3, verse 17, it says, And now, brethren, I would that through ignorance you did it, as did also your rulers. But those things, things which God before has showed by the mouth of some of his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. All his prophets. Now, brothers and sisters, all the prophets, according to Peter, were speaking about the Pentecostal outpouring. But Sister White just said all the prophecies that were fulfilled then are fulfilled at the end of the world. So all the prophets of the Bible are given testimony to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the latter rain on the Seventh-day Adventist church. You get the logic? <laughs> Peter is going to say it more than once here. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus which before was preached unto you whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said unto your fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Moses said to Israel, 
that the Lord was going to raise up a prophet that's just like Moses. Moses, Moses made that prophecy. Now Peter's using Moses' prophet, prophecy to identify Christ. In other words, he's saying that Moses was a type of Christ. And if we get through our material tonight, you'll find that Moses is a perfect parallel. The reform movement in the time of Moses is an absolute perfect parallel to the reform movement in the time of Christ. In other words, that's what Peter is identifying here. Among other things, he's identifying that every reform movement parallels every other reform movement. For Moses said unto your fathers, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him ye shall hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul, now notice this, and the reason you want to notice this, Moses is saying the reform movement in the time of Moses will parallel the reform movement in the time of Christ. And we're saying that all these reform movements are prefiguring and pointing forward to the reform movement of the 144,000. And that in each of those reform movements, there's a message that comes to God's people that tests them. And what does he say? And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be what? Destroyed from among the people. Yea, and some of the prophets, all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, as many prophets as has spoken have likewise foretold these days. They foretold the days of Pentecost and Sister White says all the prophecies at Pentecost are repeated here at the end of the world. So all the prophets have foretold these days and if you don't hear the message in these days you're going to be destroyed from among the people. Am I mis misrepresenting that? Is that how you see it now? In Great Controversy, Sister White teaches the same truth. And this is the premise that we're trying to set up for this study tonight. Page 343. The work of God on earth presents from age to age a striking similarity in some of the reformatory and religious movements. Every great reformation or religious movement, the principles of God's dealing change from time to time. The principles of God's dealing with men are ever the same. The important movements of the present. And what's the important movement of the present? It's the reform movement of the 144,000. The important movement of the present presents have their parallel in those of the past. And the experience of the church in former ages has lessons of great value for our own time. The history of Adventism is what all the prophets were pointing forward to. And the history of Adventism can be illustrated under the banner of the three angels' messages. And the banner of the three angels' messages is this. The first angel's message arrived in 1798. The second angel's message arrived, it's progressive, but we're going to say in June of 1842, just for the illustration. The third angel's message arrived on October 22nd, 1844. But, we know, if I had more room, that what we're waiting for over here right now, if I extended this out, is the fourth angel of Revelation 18, right? The banner of the three angels' messages is illustrated by a 3-1 combination. These three are the first, second, third angels' message that came into history in the time period of the Millerites, and at the end of the world, the fourth angel, the angel of Revelation 18, arrives. This 3-1 combination is illustrated over and over and over again in Bible prophecy. And every time it's illustrated, it's representing the history of Adventism. The beginning of Adventism being the Millerites, the end of Adventism being the 144,000. The 144,000 are raised up during the fourth angel's message. The three angel's message came into history during the time period of the Miller writes. It's a 3-1 combination. On page 4 you'll see the, these 3-1 combination is illustrated over and over in the scriptures. And sometimes it's a very simple illustration and sometimes it's a complex. Noah and his three sons. Was the story of Noah an illustration of the end of the world? Okay, Noah and his three sons is a simple illustration. 
But in the story of Noah that we know is about the end of the world, you see the 3-1 combination. Just before the children of Israel went into the promised land, in Numbers 22, King Balak hired Balaam to curse Israel. Balaam didn't curse Israel. He gave three blessings to Israel. Then King Balak, Balak was disappointed. There's always a disappointment after that third way mark. King Balak was disappointed and sent him home. Did Balaam go home? Not before he pronounced a fourth blessing. That 3-1 combination in that story is saying that the story of the children of Israel just before they go into the promised land is the story of Adventism. Because all the prophets are speaking about the end of the world. On the Mount of Transfiguration, Christ was there with how many disciples? Three. Three-one combination. In Gethsemane, how many disciples are with Christ? Does Sister White say Gethsemane is repeated at the end of the world? It's the story of Adventism. You ever wondered why Daniel wasn't there at the test of the fiery furnace? It would have thrown off the combination. Shadrach, Meshach, and, and Abednego come to the test, which Sister White says over and over again is the Sunday law test. They're thrown into the flaming fire and a fourth appears. If Ch Daniel would have been there, Jesus is the fourth. If Daniel would have been there, it would have been a 4-1 combination and it would have wrecked the 3-1 combination, which is God's signature that this history in Daniel 3 is illustrating Adventism at the end of the world. Gideon and his three troops, Abraham and his three heavenly visitors. These are simple. There are many others. This is just to try to acquaint someone that's not familiar with it, that when you see a 3-1 combination in the scriptures, it's a, it's a prophetic signature that's identifying Adventism. Now, a complex illustration <coughs> is the 2300-year prophecy. What begins the 2300 year prophecy? Now we're dealing with the foundations of Adventism so you need to watch closely because this is sacred ground. This is the foundations of Adventism. What starts the 2300 year prophecy? The third decree. Where does it end? On the third message. How many decrees are there in this history? There are Four, because Nehemiah had to secure a decree before he came back and finished the work. There's actually one more, but we're not going to talk about that right now. And Nehemiah's fourth decree is pre prefiguring the fourth angel's message of Revelation 18. And the reason that Nehemiah had to secure a decree is because right in here, the people quit doing the work. In these illustrations, the people always quit doing the work. Well, you're going to see that this evening, Lord willing. The people always quit doing the work. Adventism has quit doing the work. We're in the Laodicean condition. The Jews back here in the time period of rebuilding the temple and the streets and the walls, they went into a Laodicean condition and the Lord had to raise up Nehemiah to finish the work and Nehemiah had to secure a fourth decree. It's not an accident, brothers and sisters. This isn't, this isn't my human application. What leads into this history here is the 70 years captivity of Israel in Babylon. Is that not true? Jeremiah 25, 12? If you understand that, say amen. They're going to come out of Babylon with, on these decrees. Do you, you do understand that this 70 years when ancient Israel was in literal Babylon, that Sister White directly compares that with the 1260 years that spiritual Israel was in spiritual Babylon. You realize that, right? Sister White makes that comparison. So here, ancient Israel comes out of literal Babylon on three decrees, and here, spiritual Israel comes out of spiritual Babylon on three messages. This isn't, this isn't an accident. This is an airtight, rock-solid illustration, and it goes along with one of the most important truths about Christ's character, which is that he's the God that illustrates the end from the beginning. He's illustrating the, be the beginning of the 2300 years, but in so doing, he's illustrating the end. That's what he does with every time prophecy, by the way. If you look closely, the beginning history illustrates the end. That's a complex history. There's places where you have Noah and his three sons. It's a, a simple illustration of the 3-1 combination, but there are complex histories. The history of Christ, Elijah, Moses, Noah, the Millerites is a complex illustration of these truths. Now, when you look at the reform movements, that's what we're doing, if I haven't been clear. 
the, the time period from 1798 to 1844 is the reform movement of the Millerites from here to here. And when you look at the prophetic way marks in this history, you'll find that they are identical to the way marks of every other history. Now, there's a brother here. Usually I wait till I know some well enough because I, I don't really, I haven't been introduced to this brother at all. And I don't want to offend him. If I, if I know you a little while, a little bit, then I will be a little bit more direct. But I'm just going to say that I know that you took the trouble to drive through the traffic of Los Angeles to be here this evening. So you need to stay awake. Okay, I'm being as gentle as I can. <laughs> All right. I, I might be more direct if we knew each other a little bit longer. In this history, there are certain way marks that are illustrated, that are illustrated in every reform movement. Okay? And, I'm, and on, the, on the bottom listing of page 4, you'll see what those way marks are. There's always a time at the end. Now, brothers and sisters, this is one we want to see here. We're going to look at these, these lines. These are these lines on this chart. Okay, these are what they are. But we're not going to take the time to deal with all these things. But what we're going to look at this week, what I do want you to see, and this is the controversy. There's people that oppose this. There's people that say that what I'm going to tell you right now, that it is error. Okay? In every reform movement, there is a time of the end. It starts with the time of the end. As Seventh-day Adventists, we know that in 1798 the book of Daniel was unsealed and that that was the time of the end and there was an increase of knowledge. And for someone to come along and say that in every reform movement there's a time of the end and it possesses the same characteristics as 1798, that just shocks some people and they say that's erroneous. So I'm forewarning you. We want to understand what the time of the end is. I'm going to tell you that there's a time of the end in every reform movement. And I'm telling you that the critics and Adventism to what we teach will tell you that that is error. So you've been forewarned. You need to pay close attention as we begin to deal with the time of the end. There's always a first message. It's the time of the end. Then there's the first message. I'll explain this as we go on. A second message. And they may not always be messages, but they'll be the way marks. And then a third. After the third message, there's always a work that's given to God's people. A backsliding condition. And then this history is repeated under the fourth message. Okay, so we're, there's more to add to that. I'm leading, this, leading it into you slowly. Okay? Next page. We'll try to build this for you so you can f follow it a little bit easier. In 1798, there was a fulfillment of prophecy. What prophecy was fulfilled in 1798? The 1260. The papacy received the deadly wound. Now, normally in Adventism, when it comes to identifying the time of the end, we don't worry about saying there's a prophecy fulfilled. I'm the one that's saying that. As, as you look at the time of the ends that begins every reform movement, you will see that there's a prophecy fulfilled. Are you with me? Because the next point is, is worth following. When this prophecy is fulfilled, it sheds light. The fulfillment of this prophecy produces light that will test this next generation. Okay, in, in, in Daniel 7, Daniel teaches in Daniel 7 that the judgment comes after the papacy receives a deadly wound. And the pioneers recognize that. They taught it. Sister White taught it. You've read it. If you've read the Great Controversy, you've read it. If you, you may not have caught it. But the, pap the papacy had to receive its deadly wound before the judgment could come. So when the papacy received a deadly wound, that was the fulfillment of prophecy. And the prophecies then that are unsealed, because at the time of the end, the book of Daniel is unsealed, right? And there's an increase of knowledge. The increase of knowledge that comes from the book of the Daniel at this time is knowledge about the coming judgment. Alright? In, in every reform movement, there's a time of the end. And the time of the end is the fulfillment of prophecy. And the fulfillment of that particular prophecy will shed light upon the coming generation. This generation is the Millerites who are going to announce the judgment. 
the first angel's message. Follow me? Okay. Um, this, this represents the increase of knowledge, these little dots. This increase of knowledge will test this generation. That's why Daniel 12.10 when it's talking about the book of Daniel being unsealed at the time of the end, verse 10 says, Many shall be purified and tried and made white, but none of the wicked will understand. But the wise will understand. What don't the wicked understand? The increase of knowledge. Okay, that's what Daniel 12 is talking about. There's an increase of knowledge, and it tests this generation. Amen? You with me? Okay. All right, some of these we're just going to touch on briefly. Before these reform movements, there's always a period of darkness. All right. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Um, and then this introduces the first message. The pioneers, we have a quote in here we're going to look at tonight. Or if, not, if it's not in these notes tonight, it's in tomorrow night from Uriah Smith. He expresses the pioneer position that identifies that in 1798... In 1798, the first angel's message arrived. Okay. Have you ever thought about when the first angel's message arrived? Raise your hand if you've thought. If you know when the first angel's message arrived. If you've actually studied that out and you know for certainty that the first angel of Revelation 14 verses 6 and 7 arrived in history in 1798. Raise your hand if you know that. And look around. There's not very many of us that know that. But the point is, we've read some quotes here earlier tonight that says we're supposed to identify the location of these messages. Remember those quotes where we started with? So it's obvious that inspiration wants us to understand when the first angel's message arrived. And it arrived when the book of Daniel was unsealed in 1798. Did the people of this generation understand the first angel's message at that point in time? No way. It was an increase of knowledge. But the Lord was going to begin raising up people that were going to, according to Daniel 12, run to and fro in God's prophetic word and come to understand this increase of knowledge. And by 1833, and you can put it before that, I'm not dogmatic about this particular date, but by 1833, William Miller's received his credentials. And this is also the year of the star, falling of the stars. And at, by this point, they know what the message is. Now it's a message. See, now, this, might, this detail might be a little bit hard to follow here, being late in the evening. The time of the end, a prophecy is fulfilled. At the fulfillment of that prophecy, there is prophetic light that is unsealed. It begins to increase. According to Daniel 12, verse 3 and 4, at the time of the end, many should run to and fro. And knowledge shall be increased. And that doesn't mean the increase of worldly knowledge. It means knowledge from God's word. Those that are running to and fro in Daniel 12 are those that are increasing in their prophetic knowledge. Pardon me. Who's saying something? Okay. But in each of these histories, there reaches a point where that knowledge becomes formalized. And William Miller was the man the Lord used to formalize that increase of knowledge. Why, why, why is it formalized? Because it's going to test that generation and the Lord's not going to test a generation unless he's given them the light that they can be held accountable for. It has to be put into an understanding that the Lord can look you in the eye and say, you have no excuse for not accepting this light. So the message is always formalized. That continues to go through history. And there comes a point in time when that message is empowered. And when the message is empowered, you'll see a divine symbol come down out of heaven. Miller's message was empowered on August 11th, 1840, when the Ottoman Empire collapsed in fulfillment of the time prophecy of 391 years and 15 days. It's found in Revelation 9.15. When we look at the reform movement of Christ, Miller is paralleling John the Baptist. And John the Baptist's message was empowered when Christ was baptized and a dove came down out of heaven. And Jesus is prefigured by Moses 
And Moses is paralleling both Miller and John the Baptist. And Moses' message was empowered when he was going back to Egypt. And Exodus tells us the Lord came down out of heaven and gave him the test of circumcision. In the third angel's message at the end of the world, how, how is it that the third angel's message is empowered? When the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down out of heaven. All right, in the, in the history of the three decrees. By the way, this might take you off guard. But in the Millerites, William Miller is the one that formalizes the message. In the reform movement of Christ, it's John the Baptist. In the form, reform movement of Moses, it's Moses. But in the reform movement of the three decrees, it's a pagan king named Cyrus. All right, and Cyrus is a type of Christ. But in that history, what empowered the first decree? When was the first decree empowered in the history of Cyrus? It's when Michael came down in Daniel chapter 12 and struggled with him to go ahead and follow through on that decree. When the message in these reform movements is empowered, you will see a divine symbol come down out of heaven. The Bible says, truth is established upon the testimony of two or three. I just ran by four or five for you. All these histories are the same. Um, one of the characteristics of these, of this first message, this is the first message here, is it's worldwide. That's what that W is for. Whereas the second message, it's local. We read last night, if you remember or not, I made you repeat it for me, so we, so I could refer back to it. I asked you, after we read the quote, where was the second angel's message fulfilled? It, and everyone said, in the United States. The second angel's message took place in a local jurisdiction, local geography, where this message, Sister White says in the Great Controversy 611, in 1840 the first angel's message was carried where? To every mission station in the world. It was worldwide. When One of the characteristics of the first message is worldwide. This is where the testing begins. There's so many of these truths that are important to understand that we're not going to deal with. We're just going to refer to them briefly. When the divine symbol comes down, the testing begins. All right? It's, it's easy, to, easy to see. John in Revelation 10, he goes and takes the book out of the angel that came down out of heaven. Sister White says that book is the book of Daniel. And what's he do with that book? He eats it and it's sweet in his mouth. It was sweet in his mouth on August 11th, 1840 because the year-day principle was confirmed. That was when it was sweet in his mouth. But if you go look at what Jeremiah and Ezekiel teach us about what it means when a prophet eats the word of God, it means a testing process is carried to God's people. And from 1840 to 1844, the Millerites were involved in a progressive testing process and the progressive testing process begins when the divine symbol comes down. So when the angel of Revelation 18 comes down at the end of the world in Adventism, the testing process has begun for Seventh-day Adventists. And the angel came down on September 11th, 2001. Um, in, in this second waymark, you'll see a manifestation of the power of God. In the history of the Millerites, it was the midnight cry. All right? One of the characteristics of the third message, as you will see, and this is the third message, October 22nd, 1844, you will see judgment illustrated. All right? After the third waymark, these are three messages, but they're also waymarks. After the third waymark, you'll see a disappointment. This is the third way, Mark. I'm moving this down here. You'll see a disappointment that follows it. The disappointment of October 23rd, 1844 was prefigured by the disappointment of the disciples after the cross. The cross lines up with October 22nd, 1844. Sister White tells us that when Ezra saw how few people came out of Babylon on the third decree, he was greatly disappointed. When Nebuchadnezzar, seeing that his three best men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, refused to bow down at the test, he was disappointed. Balak was disappointed that Balaam wasn't cursing Israel. He was blessing Israel. After the third waymark, you'll see a disappointment. Then you see a work given to God's people. A work that they're to do. After the work, they go into a backslidden condition. And then at some point in time, the fourth 
message arrives. Um, now, this being the history of the first message here, this is one of the most, th there's two things that, at least that I want to deal with here that I want to point out as we go through. One's the time of the end. We have to understand the time of the end before we get to the end of the week. And the other one is that it's in the, the history of the first decree, the first way mark, the first message, however it's represented in the history you're dealing with. It's in that history that the foundations are laid. Foundations are laid before the second message. The foundations are laid here. Now, if you were here last night, this is an important argument to see. If you're going to argue at the end of the world about what the foundations of Adventism are, and you can show that the foundations in every one of these histories are set up before the second and third way mark, then whatever the foundations of Adventism are, they have to be established before October 22nd, 1844. And in the history of the first decree, before the second decree of Darius came, in the three decrees, in the history of the first decree, we know that the foundation of the temple was laid. And we know that in the history of, of Christ, John the Baptist is the one that laid the foundational message. And we know that well before the animals got on the ark in the reform movement of, Moses, of Noah, he'd built the foundation that he needed to build before he built the ark. When you build a boat, you've got to build a, a template first. The foundation is always laid in the first way, Mar. All right. Okay. So let's look at the three decrees. Page six. <clears throat> time of the end is always a fulfillment of prophecy that sheds light upon the next generation. The time of the end in the history of the three decrees is the end of the 70 year prophecy of Jeremiah 25:12. And Sister White plainly says that that 70 years parallels the 1260 years of papal rule. So when we identify the end of the 1260 years as the time of the end for the Millerites, and I'm here telling you that the end of the 70 years is the time of the end for ancient Israel, it's, a, it's an easy type anti-type to see. At the end of the 70 years, the fulfillment of that prophecy will, will shed light upon the next generation. And what was the fulfillment of that prophecy? We read a quote tonight where Sister White says we should, we need to trace down the prophecies. We need to, we need to understand what the prophecies are. The 70 years of captivity in Babylon. When did that finish? At the fall of Babylon. When Babylon's brought down, the 70 years are over. And at the end of 70 years, what was, the, what was going to happen? What's, what's the work of this generation? To come out of Babylon and, and go back to Jerusalem and build it, right? So at, at the end of the 70 years, when Babylon's brought down, the Medes and Persians are now ruling the world, you have a fulfillment of the prophecy, and with the fulfillment of that prophecy, you have light that shed upon this generation and light is that it's now time to come out of Babylon and go back to Jerusalem, right? And there's going to be an increase of knowledge on this subject and you're, you should see illustrated students of prophecy that are recognizing that this fulfillment of prophecy has taken place and you'll see that in your notes in Daniel 9 verse 1 and 2 Daniel represents the students of prophecy in that history that recognized from Jeremiah 25 that it was time to come out of Babylon he says in the first year of Darius the son of ah 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 Ahasuerus Ahasuerus of the seed of the Medes which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans in the first year of his reign I Daniel understood by the books a number of years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem 
Daniel is the, representing those that run into and fro, running, are running to and fro at the time of the end for the reform movement of the three decrees. And there's an increase of knowledge that takes place. Um, let's turn to Ezra chapter 1. I have to be careful not to let myself get drawn into too many details here. I don't want to touch all the details. But in verse 1 of Ezra chapter 1 it says, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the word of the Lord, by the, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, and he made a proclamation. This is the first decree throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing and said, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven hath given me some of the kingdoms of the earth. All the kingdoms of the earth. See, the first decree, it's worldwide. Just like the first message was worldwide. Up here. And the first angel's message in 1840 was carried to every mission station in the world. The first, this first decree, this first message, the first way mark in every reform movement will possess some type of reference to worldwide. Now maybe you can see this. I can give you a simple example for a third witness. When the mighty angel of Revelation 10 came down in 1840, you follow that angel? The mighty angel of Revelation 10 came down in 1840 with the book of Daniel open in his hand and John takes the little book and eats it, alright? And Sister White says that's 1840 because in 1840 the first angel's message is carried to every mission station in the world. This is the beginning of Adventism. This is the Millerite history. Is there an angel that comes down at the end of Adventism? It's the angel of Revelation 18, right? So this angel of Revelation 10, it's an easy type anti-type to the angel of Revelation 18. But you should see a worldwide aspect. And what does it say about the angel of Revelation 18? The earth was lightened by its glory. See, this first way mark, you'll always see this worldwide aspect. Okay, because every reform movement's the same. Alright? Um, in the first... In the first decree, if you look closely in your Bible, we're not going to take time. The foundation of the temple was laid during the history of the first decree. Right? The second decree comes from Darius, and you will see no reference in that decree that Darius is the king of all the kingdoms of the earth. The second decree is just the nuts and bolts on how to rebuild and restore Jerusalem. Now, I asked earlier how many decrees there were, and most of us said three, and then I said there's four. But then I said there's actually five. If you read closely, there's five decrees in this history. There's one that comes right here. Did you know that? It's in uh, Ezra. Um, chapter f 4, verse 21. In between Cyrus, which is the first decree, and Darius of the second decree, there's another king. And in chapter 4, this other king, in verse 21, the enemies of the Jews have went to him and said, you need to make the Jews quit building Jerusalem. And in verse 21 of chapter 4 of Ezra, it says, Give ye now commandment to cease, to cause these men to cease, and that this city be not built it until another commandment shall be given for me. And if you drop down to verse 24, it says, Then cease the work of the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. So it ceased until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Why am I saying this? I'm saying here is Cyrus's decree. Here is Darius's decree. Down here will be Artaxerxes's decree. But in here... We have a decree by a king that Sister White calls False Smyrtus. And his decree is to stop the work. These other decrees are to do the work. That's why you don't count his decree. But what his decree represents is something that you always find in the second way mark. You see the activities of the enemies against the work of that generation illustrated. Here he's stopping the work. It's in this history of the second decree because it was because the work that was stopped that the Jews went and appealed to Darius, 
And Darius read the old decrees of Cyrus and got the work started again. You can't separate the decree that stopped the work from the second decree. They're cause in effect. They're connected to each other. And in the history of the second way mark, here's the second decree. You always see the activities of the enemies. And that's what marks the second angel's message in the history of the Millerites. Because it's here that the Protestants close their doors against the message. One of the way marks, one of the characteristics of the second way mark is you will always see the activities of the enemies of that generation. Okay? Now if you find this study interesting but you think I'm going too fast and I'm not covering it very deeply this is the, the study that you can get a hold of and go through it point by point in detail and uh, I would challenge you to do, do so because this chart is what gets covered in that presentation and there's no way we're going to cover all the points on this chart tonight. We're not even going to try. Um, in the second decree you, you'll see the manifestation of the power of God. Then in the third decree you're going to see judgment illustrated and if you read very carefully in the third decree um, it's probably in here Ezra 7 verses 12 through 28. Go to Ezra 7 and I can make this point pretty easily. In, this, in the third way mark, the third decree, the third message, you will see some type of judgment illustrated. And in chapter 7 verse 24 through 26, national sovereignty is returned to the Jews. <clears throat> I won't read those verses because of time. We're about ready to take a break here. We've been going an hour. But it's in the third decree that Artaxerxes provides the legal pronouncement that the Jews can pass judgment on civil civil problems and religious problems even to death. They could punish someone that broke a civil law up to death and a religious law up to death and it's marking that their national sovereignty has been returned to them. This is the logic for starting the 2300 days on the, first, on the third decree. This is when it's legally and fully restored as a nation. It can now punish its own criminals, civil and religious, but what it means is that they're able to judge their criminals. Judgment has been returned to them. And then you'll see in your quotes on page 7 two places where Sister White says after the third decree Ezra was disappointed, lining up with the disappointment of the Millerites after October 22nd, 1844. They still had the work to do, which was to finish the streets and the walls, even in troublous times, but they quit doing the work, if you remember the story. Just like Adventism quit doing the work that was given to them shortly after 1844. You can say that without being critical of the church, because Bible prophecy teaches it over and over and over again. It's just the fact of the matter that before the fourth angel accomplishes its work, God's people have to be revived. They're Laodiceans. They need to be awakened. They need to receive the Laodicean message. And you see this illustrated in the three decrees. And then on the top of page 8, you will see that when, and this board's too short, that when Nehemiah is finally going to finish the work, he secures the fourth decree in that history, prefiguring the fourth angel's message. Okay. Let's have a word of prayer and we can take a break. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we, we wish that you'd get, awaken us, revive us here this evening. Um, we've had long days in a busy city, a busy, busy life. Um, awaken us, give us a little bit of refreshing here in this break and bring us back um, that we might finish considering these truths um, with open minds and retentive minds that we can understand what these lines upon lines that you provided for us in your words are are informing us, informing us of that we can understand the events that are about to take place and bring our lives into agreement with these truths through the power of your Holy Spirit we thank you for the privilege of hearing these things when so many in the world aren't hearing any of these things in Jesus name Amen.